first of all, thanks to everyone for inviting me down here, especially thanks to uh, CESC and to um, my folks at Reflective who helped organize this. I'm going to talk a little bit about our chain, um, the our chain network, but but uh, I just wanted to mention that, oops, let's go back. Our chain is a cooperative. It's the first of its kind in this in this sense. It's the first publicly owned, publicly operated blockchain, and we're very proud of uh, the fact that it's a cooperative, um, <clears throat> because that means that our governance is based upon democratic principles. And that ties into what I want to talk about just to introduce our chain. So the real question is, why are we doing our chain? Gosh, there's lots and lots and lots of blockchain projects out there. <clears throat> why, why, why do we need another one? Um, so from our perspective, um, from really, I think that the membership has coalesced around this idea is that is our chain is all, blockchain in particular, is all about rebooting coordination technology. Um, and if we, if we take a look uh, at the recent UN reports uh, from the senior science advisory uh, positions, we have a, a very serious situation on our hands. They give us about 12 years <laughs> uh, in which to uh, dramatically change um, our consumption patterns um, and supply chain management patterns, or we're going to face uh, catastrophic changes with respect to uh, climate and environment. That means we're all going to have to coordinate uh, in a completely different way and at a different scale. Um, and so what constitute our coordination technologies? Well, in, in our view, there are three sort of main coordination technologies. One of them is finance. So we can think of capital really um, in its, it, it, when you boil it down to its essence, it's a way of taking care of each other and the planet. That's what it's there for. Um, unfortunately, if capital gets stuck in the hands of a very few, we don't get to explore very many of those coordination models. We have only a very few coordination models available via the mechanism of capital to begin to coordinate each other. Um, so we might think uh, capital needs, uh, or finance as a mechanism of coordination, needs a bit of a reboot. A similar sort of thing is happening on the governance side. Um, especially if we look at the U.S., the U.S. has been uh, relatively slow and gotten even slower in the last two years in terms of the kind of governance that would be necessary in order to engage in the changes that uh, would, would stay, stave off or at least <clears throat> um, put us on a different path with respect to the, uh, the changes that are coming down the pipe. And then finally, um, uh, uh, an emerging branch of, of coordination technologies are the social media. And again, um, it would appear that these need a bit of a reboot. Um, it's probably not a good idea to have um, a news and information utility that serves over a billion people uh, being in the hands of a centralized party. That's probably not a good idea, especially if that platform could be weaponized <laughs> to influence the elections of a, of a major company. So from our point of view, these coordination technologies, which are essential um, to us being able to handle the changes coming down the pipe, all need a reboot. And the blockchain provides, uh, I don't have to say very much, uh, here, I think probably all of you are aware that the blockchain provides a reboot for all of these. It clearly provides a reboot for, uh, for finance. Um, blockchain itself is in need of a governance model, but there's a nice dog food relationship, a nice cyclical relationship, because you can use blockchain tools um, in order to approach, uh, to build on-chain governance tools. Uh, everything from voting to the expression and capture of sentiment and all of that then <clears throat> also feeds into social network style solutions. So in that context, what was our chain's promise? So our chain's promise uh, was a technology uh, for coordination at global scale. That means visa level transaction rates and Facebook uh, data volumes. So let's think about that, right? So visa does on the order of 40,000 transactions per second. Now let's compare that with the incumbent blockchains. 
Um, so maybe seven transactions per second on the Bitcoin network or 15 transactions per second on the Ethereum network, right? So we're talking several orders of magnitude in, in improvement without compromise to the trust model. So it's very important that if we go back, it's very easy to achieve 40,000 transactions per second if you compromise on the trust model. If you make your solution a centralized solution, that's not hard to do. We've been doing that for decades. Um, but not compromising on the trust model and keeping and getting to those transaction rates is a mean trick. Um, a similarly, there's a, there's a similar set of considerations for the data volumes. But this has been our promise uh, to our community and to the world at large. And let's see where we are in terms of delivering on our promise. In Berlin, in September, we launched our test net. And <clears throat> within a single shard, so our chain is a sharded solution. It's automatically sharded because of the computational model that we use. But um, even within a single shard, we're actually clocking in excess of 1,500 transactions per second. Now, some people are going to quibble, what do you mean by transaction? We mean <clears throat> a notion of of interaction between smart contracts that we call a common event that's better suited when we talk about a wide range of applications that are not just financial applications. So um, that means that you would only have to have 10 shards, less than 10 shards, in order to achieve visa level uh, transaction rates. Just yesterday, we announced a six-fold improvement even within a single shard. So we believe that by the time we hit mainnet, even within a single shard, we'll already have these kinds of transaction rates. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, in the testnet uh, demonstration, we've already demonstrated uh, tokens and wallets, smart contracts. So we are already on par um, with Ethereum and uh, the other blockchain 3.0 uh, networks. By the way, I should just mention that we did this at the top of this year. At the top of this year, we began with just a nascent compiler running to our computation model. And so, so effectively, we had almost no code at the top of these, this year. By the time we hit September, we had these kinds of numbers. Uh, that should be very, very impressive. And what enables that is the fact that our chain sits uh, and, is, and sits on top of and is developed out of, of a mathematical model that makes the performance possible. Now, um, one of the reasons that we're able to do this um, is because we have shifted our consensus model. So instead of proof of work, we use a form of proof of stake uh, that is called a CBC or correct by construction Casper. So that's a, a protocol, a consensus protocol that's been in co-development uh, amongst uh, uh, researchers in Ethereum and our chain and other people around the world. Um, so Vlad Zamfir and I have worked extensively on it and there are many other people probably here in this room uh, that have been involved in it uh, and uh, several members of the Archain community uh, have been working on it actively. In fact, Archain is the first implementation of CBC style Casper and, <clears throat> um, and is the first pure proof of stake implementation. So that's one of the reasons. And again, that's grounded in a mathematical description of the protocol. Likewise, just because you have a economically secured, leaderless, distributed consensus protocol, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've made a good choice about what you're going to store with that. So if you think about you know, the real breakthrough with respect to Bitcoin, what was it about? Well, it was about um, the demonstration that there were a class or family of consensus protocols that, um, that were heretofore un unexplored. Um, and those were the economically secured, leaderless, distributed consensus protocols. So, uh, one, but you can think of the first family of those as, a, as somewhat like HTTP 1.0. 
right? It was not the, not the best protocol. In fact, it was a really stupid protocol. In fact, no computer scientist in their right mind would design a protocol like that. It took a physicist to design a protocol like that. But its stupidity was its saving grace. First of all, network administrators sitting, uh, sitting there looking at the protocol could go, yeah, this protocol does nothing, so it's safe to open up the firewall and let it through. So that was one of the ways that HTTP was able to achieve the network effects. Uh, the other was it was easily understandable. And a similar kind of thing happened with the proof of work style protocols, was they were easily explainable and there was a quick proof of existence, but they won't ever scale. And in fact, we are beginning to see the end of the commercial viability of proof of work. So over time, it will become less and less advantageous to have large mining operations because the price of the coin doesn't match the price of the cost of those operations. So unless there is a blockchain 3.0 offering that significantly changes those economics, we're going to see a major shift in this market. Fortunately, the Casper protocols are, represent exactly that kind of shift. Now, taking it as stipulated that there are better economically secured uh, leaderless distributed consensus protocols, the next question is, well, you got all these agents that now agree on a value, right? They all, they all agree on either a ledger or some other value. What should you store? So the, the Bitcoin answer is, of course, you store a ledger. Ethereum gives you a better answer, says we'll store the state of a virtual machine and then you can encode a ledger on top of that. That immediately raises the next question, what kind of virtual machine? And here Ethereum has not made the best choice because they've chosen a sequential machine. And that means that Ethereum has anti-scaling characteristics, right? As you add more resources, more and more compute resources, you have more and more contention for those resources. So you need a computational model that provides concurrency and parallelism as a part of its native operation. And that's the other thing that our chain provides. So the row calculus model of concurrent computation underlies the Rolang smart contracting language in our chain. And that is the other key to our performance improvement. <clears throat> so, but let's, uh, <clears throat> Let, let's talk about that in terms of uh, understandable proof points, right? So if you're, <clears throat> if you're not like me and you, 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 love, you get up and, and are excited, you eat, breathe, and, and live mathematics, uh, maybe you want to see other kind of proof points. So I'll talk about that in, the, in a couple of slides from here, but I'll talk about that in terms of a couple of applications that are already uh, well underway. And in fact, la yesterday we had a demonstration of a third application well underway. Um, but uh, but the, the big picture is that we have over 26 companies already signed up to deliver on top of the R-Chain platform. And we have a membership that's now at 1,600 strong in terms of the cooperative. So we have many, many, many people who are taking the platform and, and building it. So what are, uh, what are the kinds of things that we're building? Well, here's an example of the kind of thing uh, that we're building. Uh, one uh, that is now in alpha is CryptFX. So CryptFX is an IDE that interacts with the blockchain, right? So it allows people to write smart contract style code um, and, and have that stored and, and run and executed on the blockchain. Um, so it's really important to think about these markets, right? Because when we enable developers, um, developers then enable rich ecosystems of applications. So the idea is that um, if you look actually at the tools market, there, there, it's a multi-billion dollar business if you include all the analytics, including Mathematica, MATLAB, um, SAS, and all of those others. Um, so when you combine those with things like Eclipse, and IntelliJ and other kinds of, of environments like that. You're talking a multi-billion dollar market, and the developers typically don't, are not able to take part in the profits of that market. By putting this on the blockchain and making it monetizable at a much more fine-grained level, um, this, this enables uh, a, a significant influx of economic energy into the developer market. 
Another one that I'm particularly proud of, because it, it fits into our overall financial story, it also demonstrates something that's impossible with the other chains, um, uh, whether you're talking chains that have a, uh, uh, a, a trust model that's more or less in alignment with Bitcoin or not, is our song. So with our song, we are delivering audio data from the chain. And you can try it out right now. If you go to Google Play uh, on your Android phone, you can get our song. If you would like to become a beta for the, uh, for the iOS app, uh, come and see me after the talk, and I'll get you set up with the link so you can join the beta. What you will find when you download our song is, first of all, the blockchain disappears into the background. The first and foremost thing that's in front of you is an audio experience like you've never had. It's an immersive audio experience um, that's built on a new codec that gives you a complete around your, around your head, around your body experience of audio. And you get this experience just with ordinary earbuds. You don't have to have special speaker technology. You don't have to have special head tracking technology. You can get this with the ordinary earbuds. So what happens is our chain is taking a page from other brilliant uh, 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 computer scientists and folks uh, from this area that if you want people to really understand what you're doing, make proof points that show that your compute helps their lifestyle. Right, so what's front and center in, in our song is the audio experience. And then it just happens that there's a wallet hiding in plain sight. And that wallet is um, capturing the playback count of the songs that you're listening to. So you automatically get a wallet, which everyone is expecting, right, when they, they deal with, a, uh, with an app that delivers them content that they like. Um, but that playback count is being tracked and sent up to a smart contract that's running on our chain. And that smart contract then fractions that play count out to all the contributors who made that audio content based upon the metadata of the song. You can't do this on Ethereum. You can't do this on Bitcoin. All right, so just, just, just to recap what I've said, we've got about seven minutes left in this talk. So... The artists and, uh, like Imogen Heap, who, whose uh, tiny human song you can hear on our song today, uh, or the California Guitar Trio and their song Euphoria, they submit their content to a cloud service, which encodes their content in the special codec and then puts it into the uh, our chain nodes. And then our song talks to a proxy. Uh, the our song player, which you can get on your apps, talks to a proxy which then goes back to the R nodes and, and uh, picks up the data. Um, and I have mentioned the, the Roland contract. Um, so our song is also a test of the platform stability. So we have aggressive caching like every other real-time service. There's aggressive caching. Um, but what it, uh, but uh, even under this load, we're able to, we're able to to deliver, and on the other side, we're, we're able to put pressure on our dev team to find exactly those load patterns and, and uh, those usage patterns which cause the node to, to perform less well. In fact, as a result of this very one thing, we put enough pressure to change the threading model inside the implementation, so we just saw a six-fold improvement. Also, our song provides an application template for many of our portfolio companies and for all of you out there that might be interested in um, uh, uh, taking a look at building applications on top of uh, um, the our chain platform. Um, and I should mention, um, before going on to, the, to this slide here, um, that the Arsung application on the back end, the, the player took a different kind of resource, but on the back end, uh, dealing with the, uh, with the R-Chain um, uh, um, infrastructure, it took 2.5 engineers six weeks to get to an application like this. We just saw a demo of an MVP for a, a company that wants to revitalize journalism. They had a similar characteristic, about 2.5 engineers, about two months to get to their MVP. 
This is, this is what enables uh, uh, the kind of rapid adoption of this t technology. And with these two application templates, you can get even faster. These, these guys uh, got there with nothing to support them. <laughs> they had to invent it out of thin air. Um, uh, but now there are plenty of sample applications, uh, which means that you can take these sample applications and tweak them and get to market even faster. So the other question that you might ask yourself is why would we put data on chain at all? Why would we do that? Well, first of all, because we can, because it's one of the coolest demonstrations of, a, of real platform capability. <laughs> um, the other is because it helps us track provenance. Um, and the other is because it begins to address what it means to have ownership of data. Right now, as a culture, we don't really have an understanding of, what, of the consequences of our data use patterns. You know, the taking, you know, sharing billions of cat memes has a direct environmental consequence, right? There are these giant data centers out there that we're all not really cognizant of. They're spewing out heat as a result of our <laughs> desire to share our next meal with our friends. So having communities decide what data is valued uh, becomes important. Um, uh, so with respect to provenance, one of the things I want to just point out very quickly is that uh, we start with the arts and entertainment market because there's much lower risk to the kinds of transactions that we're talking about. Ultimately, this is all about supply chain management. And provenance with respect to supply chain management is absolutely critical. You need to know that there's a correlation between, uh, uh, within the data and between the data and the outside world. So both of those integ uh, integrity constraints must hold, right? Otherwise, pallets of drugs that were supposed to show up somewhere um, uh, uh, don't show up there or don't show up at the right time. If that happens, people die. If a song doesn't get downloaded, nobody dies, right? So this is a part of our market strategy, but it also, what it does is it lays out this template. You could change only the face of our song and leave everything the same and suddenly you have a photo sharing app. You leave everything the same and suddenly you have a video sharing app, right? So this is the kind of thing that becomes possible with our chain and these templates enable that and on-chain provenance is very much a crucial part of that story if we think forward about our applications. All right, so I'm just gonna move right along because I've got one minute and, and uh, 30 seconds left. Um, the economic model is different. With Ethereum, you have to pay for your storage all up front. Nobody's gonna pay $10,000 to store a song. Much better to amortize that cost over time. The R-Chain economic model makes that possible. Um, and it also makes it possible for a community to decide over time what data is worth storing and what data isn't. So there are a lot of partners that are involved. Um, for our song, for example, Immersion Networks um, helped us with the audio technology. They're doing amazing stuff. Watch out for them. It's going to change the change music forever. Uh, Pyrofex are our development partners, um, and of course, the co-op itself. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about music as a coordination technology. Right. So one of the things that we, we recognize and, and why music is so valuable to us is that we are literally harmonized by a good song or a great performance. Think about that. Think about the last time you saw a show, what it does for you and why you go there. So in general, music has been one of the most powerful organizing uh, uh, influences in the whole of human experience. And with our song in particular, we're, we're actually taking this to the, a new dimension with the immersive audio. Um, why you should do our chain? Well, um, one of the things that's really important is if you're going to run a bunch of these uh, uh, applications, they need to run on a network of nodes that are supporting the, uh, supporting the infrastructure. So we would love for you guys to get involved if you're interested in staking your tokens, or if you know people are interested in staking your tokens, come on out to uh, the cooperative uh, community hangout, or, or reach out to uh, staking at ourchain.coop and find out more about that. 
So with that, I'm going to leave it there. And thank you very much for your time and attention.